Okay, I I hope you all enjoy your Republic Day break. Did you go somewhere for getaway? Like short getaway? Yeah. I went to Istanbul. <laughs> that was fun, actually. Great two days. Well, on the occasion of my father's and older brother's birthday. And I also had to change my winter tires, actually. The summer and spring tires for winter tires. So that was a good occasion to be in Istanbul, two full sunny days. Excuse me? Have you been in Have you, No, well, hopefully I was not there. <laughs> but I've been almost everywhere else in Istanbul. All right, uh, such a great city. Well, I can't believe I'm living in Ankara for so many years. And All right, um, so we were talking about the threat perceptions in the Middle East. Threat perceptions are essential to understand because they're essential to at least understanding the uh, a major part of the foreign policies of any country. Actually, most countries devise foreign policies with a view to advancing their interest beyond their borders. It's a pursuit of national interest outside of the borders. This is something that I kept saying many, many times. The idea, the principle is to seize opportunities, to I mean, get these opportunities whenever they emerge, and also avert risk, to get away from risks as they come I mean, uh, to the surface. Sometimes, of course, um, you may have an advanced opinion as to what is likely to come, either an opportunity or, or uh, a risk, but it is something that requires elaborate studies and, and by people who can do that. And those who can do this kind of things are professionals uh, from diplomatic circles, military circles, political academic circles. So uh, think tanks serve uh, such a purpose to bring all these people together and, and by means of think tank studies, I mean elaborate and comprehensive studies. And of course, um, these studies can provide some uh, policy uh, options to the governments and governments can better see what is uh, likely to come ahead of uh, their time, I mean, in, in, in the future. So uh, one part of this kind of studies is, has always been threat perceptions. So without proper understanding of what or what kind of threat a country perceives from what sources, what are the sources of threat, it may not be possible to fully understand the motives behind their foreign policies. Therefore, threat perception is an essential study. Um, um, or understanding threat perceptions of uh, uh, particular countries are essential for proper understanding of their foreign policies. So um, this reading was made available for at least a week and I hope you all had copies from the reserve and I'm going to now check actually which one of you, uh, which ones of you actually had a chance to uh, at least have a look at what was in this reading because these readings are not put on the reserve just to say, stay there or just for you to make photocopies and shell them, but it is, these are for you to read, all right? Um, and these are actually an all reading material, are um, source of information that you need for proper understanding of this course, but especially considering that there will be a simulation in uh, a little bit more than a, a month, actually toward the end of next month, and um, this is something that can help you a lot, especially for some countries who will be representing Israel, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia. And, and now I would like to see um, especially representatives of these countries now being present. And I will check uh, who are present actually uh, right now. And I would like you to elaborate your understanding of your countries, I mean the country that you will be presenting at the simulation, your country's uh, threat perception. So, and um, of course provided that you had this reading and also you read this reading, not just uh, look at it, all right? Um, Egypt, uh, can I see Eralp here? Yeah, okay, here. Gözdem, yeah, sure. Um, Emine, and Enis, not here, for the records. <laughs> okay, um, who else? Israel, Bushra, I can see her around. Shuai, I see. 
Metin is here and Ege is here. Israeli team is here more or less. Jordan, um, Hazal, I think, uh, yeah, you're there. Yit, Fatma, okay. Jordanian ladies are always here, but. <laughs> uh, and Coral, Kalpak, Lolo, not present, right? And Saudi Arabia, Fatih is here. Irem Akus, Mert, Efe Köksal, Efe, right? Mert Akus, sorry. Efe Köksal, and Ömer Faruk, Tanrı Verdi. All right, um, actually I don't have any order in mind, but just uh, why don't we get started with Israel? I mean, the Israeli team, I would like the... Uh, members of the Israeli team to give us an account of their, quote unquote, their threat perceptions. How do you assess the threat perceptions of, uh, I mean, this is a chapter written by Shimon Lemone. Uh, he was, I don't, I think he must be retired now because I met him back in 1995. And he was with the Israeli Defense Ministry. And this chapter actually is something that makes much more sense because it comes from someone who work uh, at least for some time uh, for the Israeli Minister of Defense. There is someone who actually, I don't think he was a military, I don't know actually, I, I can't remember uh, back then because I met him at a conference in Lund, Sweden, and we had, of course, as usual, exchange of views and opinion about the situation in the Middle East, but I cannot remember whether he had any military background, but it doesn't make too much a difference being someone from the Israeli Minister of Defense at some higher ranking official position. Um, actually, this is something that gives him the opportunity to see things from within, of course, the state bureaucracy, of course, from the, uh, within the Israeli population, and also uh, because he writes in, in something uh, but to contribute in a book like that, uh, a unity research report like that, he's quite aware of the fact that this is going to be read by somebody else. So therefore, opinions presented here make much sense uh, as a true expression of how an Israeli officer or Israeli uh, bureaucrat or Israeli, Israeli analyst, a scholar, um, perceives the world in terms of threats posed to Israel. So now the floor is the uh, is, is yours, Israelis. Yes. Do you remember that you will have a midterm exam next week? <laughs> and the day is. Do you remember the day? Which day? 12th, that is a Friday, and the exam will start at 9 sharp and will last until 10.30. It's going to be an hour and a half, more or less, provided that you come on time and we start on time and the exam will take place in this uh, class. I don't think it's going to be recorded. Uh, at least uh, Mr. Emre can be off that particular Friday. Um, yeah. So what about the uh, Egyptian threat perception? Where were the Egyptian guys? Can you just raise it? I mean, yeah. Because, okay. Uh -huh. any, any, any assessment of what my friend here said? Uh, actually, honestly, I couldn't read that book. So I'm going to assess from my experiences. All right. You, you were in a better position than compare, when compared to many of your classmates because you had a chance to attend at least two conferences. One uh, was specifically on Egyptian uh, issue or issues related to Egypt foreign policy and that was on Turkish-Israeli relations just last week. So, all right, let's, let's hear from you. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late 90s, I guess, they pressured the international community to establish 
uh, nuclear free zone in the Middle East. They work hard for that. And uh, they are one of the um, contributors of the renewal of the MPT mm -hmm. uh, agreements. And what else? What else? Other Egyptians use them? Why didn't you read? Why didn't you, you guys read? Who read? Just let me, instead of asking who didn't read. Anybody? Just one? And he is a special student. Well, special in every sense. <laughs> All right, uh, next time I hope you will not regret for not having read the assignments. All right? So, um, any question? Okay. When it comes to threat assessment, uh, there are several issues that you have to bear in mind. I mean, to make an, a, a Proper assessment of threat is important. I mean, as I said, it is important to understand the threats as they are perceived by the sort of ruling elite or the decision makers of a particular country because, of course, not exclusively, depending on that, but to a great extent, they, take, they, they bear in mind, they keep in mind the, 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 way, the threats that they perceive in terms of uh, so, sort of decisions that they are taken with respect to their country's foreign policy. So, therefore, um, I mean, you just, I mean, the, the very purpose of simulation here is to, of course, um, you know, uh, make this course more interesting uh, because, after all, someone showing up here at all times and speaking and speaking, it turns out to be a dull experience. It's not so much an excitement. So uh, by being part of or preparing for a simulation, you go to embassies, talk with people, you attend conferences, you get together among yourselves, you make preparation, you submit reports. So these are activities that make, I hope, uh, uh, your sort of uh, teaching or learning experience a little bit more fun. So after all, we all need to uh, at least get some joy out of what the work that we're doing. Me being as instructor here, you being students here. So, but uh, after all, uh, you, put, you are going to put yourselves in the shoes of the people who are truly representing their countries in uh, international fora, in, in different platforms, in roundtable discussions, conferences, whatever, seminars. So, uh, many countries, especially those who are living in rather hostile environment or, or in such environment, in such geographical locations where there is not much stability. Uh, the politics is volatile. You, you cannot know what exactly is going to happen, if not tomorrow, but just within a month, within a year, or within uh, next uh, or a couple of years. Can you tell me exactly, with 100% confidence or with great confidence, that nothing's gonna happen in Lebanon in, in, in a month or two. No, well, Lebanon is much more stable when compared to uh, the period between 75 to 1991, well, 15, 16 year of civil war. And then several things have happened. Now there is, you know, the stability is on and off. Well, in most, uh, for the most of times, uh, is much more stable and they are trying to uh, hail the wounds of civil war, uh, the, but the, the situation, especially the, the fabric of the population is so vulnerable, so fragile, that some provocation may, can make things really uh, unexpectedly worse than it, even it was back in the 70s and 80s. So therefore, this is, a, this is a geography, this is a, a sort of environment where stability is not so much uh, of a case. Same ap applies to other countries in the Middle East. Can you tell me any particular country where you can just see five years from today that the regime will be stable? Well, 
people may come and go, but at least regime-wise, in terms of the regime, the regime will stay, will remain the same. Can you tell this with great uh, confidence? No, I mean, look at Syria. You, you, for the time being, there, is, there was some sort of a smooth passage from uh, Hafez al-Assad to his son, and the regime, yes, it improved in itself in terms of maybe some individual rights, maybe some authoritarian uh, regime, which is, of course, still an authoritarian regime because the state mechanism, the, 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 the state apparatus is pretty much the same is uh, left almost intact with some replacements. But yes, Hafez al-Assad may be closer uh, to the public than his father. Uh, sort of uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad is maybe closer to his own public than his father because he had a much more positive uh, image in, in this uh, Syrian public domain. This is, these are things that we understand from our Syrian colleagues or friends who study Syria. But you cannot tell with uh, great certainty with, it, I mean, three years from today, five years from today, ten years from today, the Syrian regime will be exactly the same. Well, same applies to Iran. Same applies to Saudi Arabia. Same applies to Jordan. Same applies to Iraq. I mean, Iraq even next week is uncertain. I mean, let alone next month, next year. Yes, there is uh, this heavyweight diplomacy and military, pr military presence of the United States on the ground and also has its grips almost everywhere. There is this uh, process of transformation of the Iraqi situation, the state as a whole. But still, there are certain factions, there are certain groups, there are certain powerful groups within the society which are, of course, uh, being, some of them are being manipulated by other countries in the region, such as Iran having uh, a high degree of influence on Shia people, not all of them, but some of them. So therefore, uh, the situation in the Middle East is pretty volatile. Well, of course, one might just turn to us and say, can you tell us with great certainty that the regime in Turkey will remain the same? Well, at least uh, my hopes would be much higher when compared to the countries in the, in the region, in the Middle East. Uh, Turkey has gone through all these difficult years, at least keeping its regime intact. And yes, there were wounds, damages um, of all what happened back in the Iraq war and the implications of Iraq war. We are going to study this in the coming weeks. Uh, this, the changing circumstances of relations between Turkey and Israel, the PKK supported by Syria for so many years uh, until 1998, and since then, yes, we are developing a number of uh, uh, steps we are taking uh, uh, through certain uh, stages that expe expectedly uh, will improve the relation between Turkey and Syria. But all of this can tell us that Middle East is uh, far too away from being stable. So therefore, when you conduct a study, a threat assessment study, there are basically two things that you have to consider for each and individual countries. You first of all look at the location of that country, the geographical location, and then you look at the historical situation with respect to uh, that country. Of course, these are not ex the two only things that you have to pay attention to. I mean, these are the major issues because history is history. What happened in history has happened, so you can change it. In some sense, well, just don't get me wrong what I'm going to say, history is somewhat static. Static in the sense that things have happened and you cannot go backwards in time and travel in time and just go and change things. This is not back to the future game, right? History has happened, but what makes it dynamic is how you interpret history. Your interpretation of history may be far more different than the uh, interpretation of others of the same historical records. Just last week, I mean, or was it just, yeah, on the 23rd, 24th, 25th of October, a, a week ago in, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom, I think I just mentioned that we discussed the, uh, the Middle East peace process, the, the, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, but there was so much 
excitement about the, now the new role that Turkey plays in the region. And people came to me, I mean, scholars, uh, scientists, ex-diplomats, ex-military people, especially from the Arab countries and uh, countries in the region, and also some Israelis also acknowledge, uh, I mean, the prof how uh, fast Turkey's profile was rising in the region. So, and they were telling me about, uh, well, Turkey is this, Turkey is that, so Turkey is doing great, so, uh, and they said even uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, if he were a candidate for presidency in any Arab country, he would win uh, the elections far ahead of the second person. So these are things about, uh, or the expressions of the admiration, especially in the public domain, among the uh, Arab people. But the moment we start talking about history, not today or future, the moment we start talking about history with our fellow Egyptian colleagues, uh, Syrian or Iraqi or uh, others, I mean, the interpretation of history uh, was far different than ours. They always look at the Ottoman Empire period as a dark age, which, uh, well, they acknowledge Ottomans uh, rule uh, in a rather sort of a balanced manner without uh, creating much difficulties. But after all, they hold the Ottoman Empire for being responsible uh, uh, for their backwardness in education. So when we read our history or teach our history or discuss our history, I mean, not myself or because I'm not a historian, so I, I don't feel competent enough to discuss these issues in depth, but even when we watch people on TV channels or when, when, when we re read their books, articles, op-eds, whatever, we understand a certain Ottoman rule, a certain uh, sort of a vision, or certain, we get a certain perception that more or less pleases us. But the same, very same history, or maybe the very same historical records are being interpreted in a far more different way uh, by people of the region. So therefore, his, the, the perception of history, or the reading of history, the interpretation of historical records, or the, the, the view about the, the past has always been and will most likely be always be uh, an important factor in the threat perception because threats are, are sort of fueled by your fears and historical or the perception of history or your reading of history also uh, uh, tells a lot about your fears. I mean, look at the situation between Turkey and Russia today. Under normal circumstances, Turkey and Russia might have had far more advanced relations even within the military domain um, between the two. But over the past two decades, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was a clear threat to Turkey, and therefore Turkey had uh, taken its part in, in the Western Alliance, NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. But then, even since then, for 20 years actually, uh, uh, have passed, elapsed since that period, and when you talk to the diplomats, the major people, and some scholarly people, especially somewhat older when compared to the new sort of scholars, uh, the view of Russia today is not so much different than the view of uh, what the Soviet Union was in the past. Because the fears are still alive. The fear of a colossal, big sort of neighbor which is capable economically and especially militarily of doing harm or causing harm to you. And therefore, this is something that fuels your threat perception. Again, I mean, uh, relations between Turkey and Syria, Turkey and Iraq, Iran, etc. So therefore, history is one particular source where you should look at. Without proper understanding of historical uh, uh, relations or the way they are being interpreted by the decision-making elite, the ruling elite, the military diplomatic elite of that particular country, you may not have a good idea, just a, or just a clear idea about their threat perception. Another thing, as I said, is geography. Again, just like history is static in, in per se, but it, it is made dynamic by way of interpretation, 
um, geography is also more or less static, at least for a given period, unless there is uh, uh, a significant change in the territories uh, or geographical uh, outlook of a region because of, I don't know, possibly wars. Because war uh, is something that changes sometimes even the political geography, not, not only the, the geopolitics. So when you look at the map, you always have this uh, source for proper threat perception. I mean, who are your neighbors? And what are their military capabilities? What are their expectations from you? What are, their, what are the issues in common which may turn out to be confrontational? Well, of course, if you can, uh, you may have some problems with uh, a country in the past, but you may work on, on, on these problems and you can just uh, uh, solve them peacefully. But certain problems or some problems are not that easy to solve in a peaceful manner, unless there is, of course, dedication on both sides or on all sides that are party to the uh, conf uh, conflict solve this problem. By looking at the geographical location, as I said, by looking at the military economic uh, capabilities as well as the, uh, the regimes of other countries that are neighboring to you, not only just the immediate neighbors but also distant neighbors, and also, in some cases, countries as far as the United States for Israel, uh, for Iran, for instance. So therefore, the intentions and capabilities of other states constitute the threat that you perceive from them, if any. Of course, uh, not all neighborhood uh, may be a threatening or just uh, unstable uh, neighborhood. I mean, there are places in Western Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, where threat perceptions, at least, uh, at least for the time being, have been mitigated. Well, there were some threats perceived in the past, but not necessarily today, or somehow are pushed to the back burner. I mean, not, not, they, they, they are not left to come to the surface, and they are not making the headlines for the time being. But um, again, the threats, uh, the military capabilities, and the intentions of your neighbors constitute the threats that you perceive. So these are important things. But of course, these are, in, in, the, in addition to this, uh, to these two more or less static or, uh, or the major inputs, ingredients in your threat assessment analysis, you also have to look at the economic situation, which is much more, of course, flexible, much more dynamic, uh, is very much subject to change on a daily basis, of course, or not daily, but in a, in a rather short term. But also, there is this uh, political issue, I mean, the political regimes. Political regimes, again, may change, and once a regime changes, the threats, the very history or the very geographical location of that country being the same or remaining the same, just because of change in the political regime of that country, that country may either turn out to be a threat or may not be anymore as, more, as serious a threat as it used to be. So therefore, these are issues that you have to bear in mind. History, geography, economic situation, and political situation. The first two are more, more or less not at all times, not forever, more or less static. So therefore, their analysis is much more easier. I mean, just by looking at history, you know, if you have access to primary sources, archives, documents, and reliable interpretation or reliable secondary sources. And also, geography itself is, is there. It tells a lot but all by itself. And of course, one particular aspect here is how uh, capable are you in terms of getting the real input or the correct, accurate data about the military capabilities of any particular country? In today's world, it is not that difficult to have at least more or less an assessment of what kind of military capabilities a country may have. And therefore, I mean, it's not something totally secret. It's not something that you totally beyond your reach. There are many, many sources in the open literature, databases, think tank reports, etc., which provide more or less 
again, uh, of course, none of them can be 100% accurate, but more or less a good estimate about the military capabilities of uh, any specific country. Just go, for instance, um, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI. If you're interested in the military capabilities of any country, just check the website of this, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. It publishes almost every year uh, a yearbook about the military capabilities. Well, you may agree, disagree with some of the data provided that you have a better explanation or you have better data, but or some interpretations may be not fully correct if you know that particular country, but on the overall, it's an invaluable source. It's a very, very valuable source of information for uh, conducting a research and study on military capabilities of any country in the world. I mean, they have almost at least half a page or up to 10 pages or even more for specific countries. So therefore, what I was uh, trying to say was when you talk about or write about threat assessments, you have to start with how or what the geography tells, what the hist history tells about that particular country's threat perception. And also uh, above this or in, in addition to that, what the political regime tells us about the threat perception and what the economic situation tells us. Because economic situation has uh, uh, to do, I mean, just like any other thing. I mean, also this is, this is something that also applies to political regime, but also, uh, but more, more so, the economic situation has two dimensions. First, it has to do with the economic capabilities or financial capabilities of that particular country in terms of uh, arms procurement for, for uh, and, uh, arming itself it, if it is so necessary for that country, whether it has the capability or ability to procure arms, weapons, or other types of uh, security systems. And also, I mean, this is uh, something uh, that is significant for some analysis, but also, uh, what is the situation in the public domain? I mean, whether the population is happy with the economic situation, are there any internal domestic uh, political problems that may have repercussions for the, for the regime, that may have repercussions for uh, the relations with other countries? For instance, I mean, in terms of economic situation or, in, uh, or economy being one of the uh, uh, criteria that we just talked about, history, geography, economic situation, and political situation, I mean, almost all of them, of course, depend on economic situation. Any country, I mean, not only the ones in the Middle East, in South Asia, in North America, Latin America, Europe, etc., everywhere. But we just talk about the, how much the economic, uh, uh, the changes in the economic circumstances, in, in the economic situation, affected the position of Egypt. And that's why Abdulmanim Said Ali uh, places emphasis on this particular situation, from geopolitics to geoeconomics. I mean, first and foremost among, in his analysis, comes the changing economic situation because of the war in the Gulf. We just mentioned very briefly last week that because of the war, the first war, 1991 war, and in the period leading up to the war, I mean, just before the war, and starting from that moment onwards, and for so many years that followed, the Egyptian workers who have gone to the Gulf countries, uh, work there, find uh, uh, work, and, and make an earning, make a living, and then not only that they, they themselves being uh, employed because of the significant population of Egypt, uh, and there was not so much work uh, to do and not so much employment in, in, in Egypt. Many of them have gone to the Gulf, not only that they were employed as such, but also they were making a living, ma making incomes, and sending part of them back to Egypt. And this situation has been significantly tampered with the uh, war in, in the Gulf. 
then comes, of course, the situation with respect to the uh, geography. I mean, what is the most important thing from the Egyptian perspective in terms of the, um, I mean, the, the sort of uh, the most vital asset of Egypt? Any idea about what is the most important thing for Egypt? No, no, I'm telling you. Yes. What was your name? Kurshad. No idea about what the most important thing for, for Egypt might be? Does this uh, map tell you anything? No? You're not looking at the map? Can't you see anything significant for Egypt? No. All right. Who, who sees anything? Yes, please? Excuse me, I can't hear you. Nile? Nile Sea? You mean river? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. The Nile River. Any idea about where it originates, the Nile? Which way the Nile flows? Upwards or downwards? Or, I mean, this way or this way? I, I shouldn't say upwards or downwards. I mean, this way or this way? This way. All right. Because some people might think it comes all the way from the Mediterranean into the uh, Central Eastern Africa. No. It originates from here, the Horn of Africa. And nowadays, um, this issue, the, the headwaters, headwaters of the Nile, is becoming a much more a significant issue for um, Egypt and also for the region because it's one of the most important sources of not only because for agriculture but also for energy generation. So no one from the Egyptian, Egyptian perspective, no one should tamper with the waters, the free flow of waters of the Nile River because the Nile is not totally entirely within the Egyptian territory. It originates from uh, the uh, Horn of Africa here. And therefore, the headwaters of the Nile River and the, the way it flows all the way, I mean, this is downstream riparian, although when you look at the map, you see like an upstream. No, it is not. The, uh, so the headwaters being here and the, uh, the Egypt being a downstream riparian, it is heavily, if not entirely, but uh, to a very great extent, it is heavily dependent on the waters of Nile for its economy, agriculture, which is a great source of employment, and also, of course, uh, providing food for the population, which is not rich, and also for generating electricity. So therefore, any attempt to change the flow or to affect the flow of the Nile River would be something uh, uh, as hostile as any armed attack to any country. So therefore, a threat is not only perceived from the military capabilities of other states. Of course, these are major source of threats in terms of uh, how you make your analysis in, 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 or how you uh, sort of devise your perception. But here, the very um, waters of the Nile are the most important things, among other things, for the security of Egypt. Without Nile, Egypt is almost nothing because it's uh, almost desert here. And uh, if you have a chance to flow, fly over this territory, you can see that both banks, I mean, right and uh, 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 left-hand sides of the Nile are just, because of agriculture, it's all green, but the rest is desert. And not so much, uh, well, except for some uh, oil and gas reserves here, but this is not that, uh, that this is not something that makes it significant in terms of oil and gas. Well, it, it somewhat exports, uh, but not as much, of course, as any other Gulf countries or Saudi Arabia. So therefore, when it comes to threat perception, just a specific case like Egypt, now you have uh, something which is not necessarily primarily militaristic, but something maybe even more significant than any military threat 
because this is something that, uh, uh, in a sense, makes the Egyptian economic life, public life, political life, of course, dependent on the uh, regime of the borders of the Nile River. Okay, let's give a break here and we'll continue with other countries. <laughs>